everybody and welcome to Two Goals. I'm Maria Laura. And I'm Katia. And today's episode will be focused on the young ones, the talents who are yet to be discovered, but also about new technologies and how its tools could become an enhancer for women's football development. To unveil a project which promises to change perspectives on that, we have Victoire Cojevina with us today. Born in the US, raised in Argentina, and with a pluricultural path in life, she has worked in a variety of areas, such as fashion and sports. She's now the co-founder and CEO of Silicon Soccer, a company promising to disrupt football scouting and intermediaries work through an app called Gloria. She's here to share and inspire us with her story. Victoire, welcome to Two Goals. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Victoire, thank you uh, for accepting our invitation. And to start this interview, we know for a fact there is a story to share about your first connections with football. Mm -hmm. All about the match day environment, listening to the noise of the fans or the inchas in the South America, a passionate football continent. Would it be possible for you to share this story with our audience? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's my favorite story, actually. So I was raised in Argentina, as, as you well mentioned in your introduction, and I was fortunate enough to have a brother, an older brother, that was a crazy fan. He was actually a hooligan. Uh, he's now, you know, married, has two kids, works in, you know, in, in real estate. He's not, he's not a hooligan anymore, but he, he used to be one. And as I, as I was growing up, he started taking me to a stadium with him. Uh, we're big fans of Racing Club, which is an Argentinian team. And he would go to La Popular, which is essentially where all hooligans get together. It's the rowdiest, craziest part of the stadium. There's no actual seats. So you're standing the entire time and there's uh, these metal structures in the, in the form of a U-shape, inverted U-shape, that they put in between the stairs to make sure that whenever there's a goal celebration, there's not like a human avalanche happening, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty crazy. And he would put me in front of one of those metal structures to make sure that whenever there was a goal celebration, that whoever was behind me would get stopped by the structure. Um, but anyways, I started going to a stadium at age five and I went all throughout my teenage years. And, and obviously it's become a big part of my life. Uh, and I discovered football there. I made friends that were very different to me, that were definitely a different gender, so they were not women. Uh, and they were older, they were from different places within Argentina, different cultural backgrounds, and it really made me understand that football is probably one of those very rare human connectors um, that can get you in touch and connected to literally anyone in the world because the, the barriers are very low. They're actually non-existent. I always say that, that it is a sport that has no language or cultural barrier. So that's the story. I mean, I have plenty of smaller stories within that, but that's, that's how I discovered the sport. Well, actually, you also have something really interesting from your upbringing, which is also kind of rare. And it's diplomacy and international relations. And your father was a Greek diplomat. You were born in the US, raised in Argentina. You study a bachelor in London and you speak four languages. Thinking about today, what kind of values do you think this kind of multiculturalism gives to your life? And kind of like cliches aside, was the sport a common language for you to connect with others? Good question. So yes, I did grow up being the daughter of a diplomat that has served me very well, uh, I must say, especially in football. Being diplomatic in business generally pays off very well. Uh, sometimes I am diplomatic to a fault. I don't like to make fights. Uh, and, and as a woman in this space, I had to. But um, but it definitely helped me a lot in terms of, you know, now that I'm at the helm of a company that is truly global at its core. Uh, I understand markets very well because I lived in them. I speak their languages and, and I know their cultures. Um, and again, I mean, uh, going back to your question around how football connected me um, or, or is a global connector, I 
used football as a way to insert myself in the different places I lived in. So I've lived in 11 cities by now. Um, and that, you know, the, the first batch was because of my dad and his work. And, and the second batch was because of my own decision. And every single time I've moved into a new city, I always, you know, make sure to understand the football landscape, uh, to understand where, where fans congregate. Uh, I've been in the U.S. for the last few years, so the MLS has become a big, big tournament that I follow, a big league that I follow, um, and I, I truly use it to make friends. I mean, today it's everything in my life. It's not only my passion, but it's also my profession. It's also what you know what gives me a salary, uh, and it's become you know the biggest part of my life. So, so yeah, absolutely. I think that being brought up in different cities made me more prone to wanting to do something like this. And to keep discussing the non-traditional path. And you, you were you were kind of like telling a bit about this before this recording. It, it is good and it's a, uh, I think it is important for us to bring this kind of discussions to this podcast because no one has the same path like others. And all of them are kind of precious and value, valuable uh, to try and achieve their, their own objectives. So in 2010, after graduating from high school, you move into fashion, becoming an intern at W Magazine, which is, for people like me, something incredible, which is because it is a world-recognized brand and a dream come true for those following this area around the world. Why taking a step further I mean, from sports or maybe you weren't like that connected in that time, thinking about this path in your life. Or could you just build a bit about the relation between your job now in football and fashion from your experiences? Yes, absolutely. Actually, I think, you know, non-traditional paths are pretty common in women that work in football. Uh, I think that's starting to change because you can actually go to college and get an education around it. But when I decided to go to college, which was not that long ago, uh, there was nothing like that in the market. Um, so non-traditional paths are my favorite. I always, I always celebrate them when I see them because I think that at the end of the day, it's a societal structure, right? That people tell you that you need to do things in a certain way. And then that actually limits you and caps the different things that you can do in your life. Um, so in my specific case, I grew up being a, a big fan of football, but I also was a big fan of fashion. And I followed a lot of designers and I love to dress up. I still do actually, which is something a lot of people like to make fun because I'm probably always the most, the most dressed up person in any room. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're talking about football or technology. And, um, and I just loved it. It was a big thing for me. And I had a, my aunt had worked in fashion for a long time, had been the editor in chief of Harper Bazaar in, in Germany. And to me, it was, you know, seeing her life and what she was doing was such a dream. And, you know, you say that, that W Magazine sounds great to you and to me too, it was a dream come true. I mean, after watching The Devil Wars Prada and all, all, all those movies, it was like, I get to do the same thing and, and work next to people that have, you know, made historic moves within the industry. Um, but now, you know, during my time in fashion, I worked in styling. That, that, was my, that was my thing, editorial styling. And I worked with a lot of models. And I actually always joke that football players marry models. So I didn't went that far away from it uh, when I decided to go into football. Uh, it happened... It happened very naturally. My mother was working in the sport. She had been a wealth manager for many years and then decided to become an agent to better serve her clients. Um, and, you know, I was obsessed with what she was doing, right? It was such a new world. She was, at the time, the only woman doing it. Uh, and, and to me, you know, I look up to my mother quite a lot. She's, she's been a big part of my life. Um, and when the opportunity came where she said, you know, I'm seeing this is growing, this business is growing, there's a real need to, to help Latin American players come into the MLS. And I think that we can, you know, leverage a lot of other things, especially around their image. 
And I had worked with image for a long time in fashion, right? I mean, the whole th the whole point of editorial styling is making pictures and people look beautiful so you can sell product. Um, so she, I think that that's what she thought would make me great at that job. And I honestly don't think I would have ever even considered it if it wasn't her offering it to me. Uh, and I left everything and I moved to Miami so I could work with her on this. And it was, you know, it was a startup experience. We were trying to figure out everything from the get go. And we had the added, you know, frustration of, of our gender becoming a thing when we were trying to do business, which we overcame, I think, pretty successfully. Uh, but overall, I must say that, you know, in I think the first two months that I was working at the agency and like kind of building everything from its logo to what we stand for to like, who are the types of clients we want and all of that. I realized that football was the thing I wanted to dedicate the rest of my life to. Uh, and it was pretty amazing. I was lucky. I was young. And I think some, some people take longer to figure that out. And when it happened, it was so clear. You know, it's like when you, when you supposedly find the one that you want to marry and, you know, immediately, I think that for me, that happened with football. I was like, this is what I want to do. There's so much to be done. There's so much potential. I was starting to see women's football become a thing. This was like seven years ago. So it wasn't, you know, that recently. And, and I was seeing that the technology space was completely untapped. Like, and, and to me, it was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. There was a whole aspect of politics into it that obviously having a diplomat as a father, as a father, I grew up around politicians and, and, and politics and football is a very politics oriented, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, it was like, this is perfect. This is exactly what I want to do. Uh, and, I, and, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. But again, like, I think that life happened in a way and I was open-minded. Um, I remember a lot of people, you know, kind of not understanding how I went from one thing to another. And I never really cared. That's a reality. I never really cared. Um, so I think that that's, that's what matters at the end of the day. If you're in a place where you're like curious about understanding the football world, but you're, I don't know, you're working in the restaurant business, just dive in. At the end of the day, people take very little, they think about you, but if, and if they think about themselves much more. So it's like, doesn't make any difference. Exactly. It's just to not really care, basically, not uh, care about the, what the others think and uh, go for it, go for our dreams. And uh, exactly. usually when we talk about sports, um, there's a stereotype uh, that we can only do one thing. We are only tailor-made for that. And this, uh, this is also for, for women and being ironically here because some people think that the women, we are only made for one job. And this is, of course, talking with the historical stereotype perspective that we have in our society, unfortunately. But sports in general is a place for experience-based knowledge and not always traditional sectorial and specialized education. You have had some working experiences as a social media management assistant, as a fashion assistant, as a fashion editorial assistant, and as a head of PR and image for a representation agency in football. Have you ever felt criticized for dealing with different economic sectors? And also, how do you deal with change of pace between industries, business objectives, and even to adapting to different working environments? You said the word assistant many, many times <laughs> when you were, you were talking about my... I think that's the key. That's the key, actually. Yeah, I had to do a lot of low work. Like, I had to, to start from the ground up, right? And I had to learn and earn my place. Uh, and I think that at the end of the day, that's the most important in any industry because if you don't understand the importance of the smaller work, of the work that might not feel impactful in the grand scheme of things, but are actually the oil that makes the machine work, then it's very hard to want to think about bigger stuff because you don't have the foundation. So yeah, I did a lot of that work. I actually had the incredible opportunity to work with some amazing people, visionaries, like true visionaries in the fashion industry, like Alex White, for example, who is now the fashion director at Elle magazine, but used to be the fashion director at W magazine, worked at Porter, Vogue with Chanel with like really the biggest brands in the world 
Um, and she taught me a lot that then I applied into my football career, right? The, the be attention to detail is one of those things that I think makes and, and breaks a lot of professionals at the end of the day. Uh, and, and the aesthetics of it all, right? Like my job in fashion was to make things look good. So now that we are building a technology platform in football, to me, it's very important that things look good because they sell that way. And in football, generally speaking, there hasn't been a lot of attention to that aspect of it. Um, and I think that it's an opportunity that, that is there to be taken. So I'm very grateful for, for a lot of those experiences. Yeah, we haven't, you probably don't even know, but I also did one year in med school. So I, I, I wanted to become a doctor at some point. <laughs> uh, and I've also been an interior designer. So it's like, I've done a lot of things that have nothing to do with football. But I think that at the end of the day, just made me a better professional because, and I, I don't know if professional is the right word, probably entrepreneur. And I know I don't like that word, but it is like essentially starting something new from scratch. And when you do that, you need a lot of skills that or, or mindset around figuring things out, like just figuring things out, right? I had no idea what a venture capital fund was. I had no idea what equity was or convertible notes or, I mean, any of the things that today I know very well, when I first got started, it was complete foreign language. And I think that just my experience in all these other places before, gave me the mindset to say, okay, if I figured out all these things before I can figure them out again uh, and just, you know, not giving too much explanation about why I decided to make those decisions, right? Like, I think a lot of people are scared that, pe that, that they're going to be judged because they're jumping from one place to another. But honestly, when you're 18 years old, 20 years old, it's very hard to know what you want to do. And a lot of people take years and years to figure it out. And that is so, so normal, first of all. And second of all, it makes you so much stronger. If I had only worked in football since I graduated college or whatever, I had studied business and then only did, did the football, I would have never had the perspective that I have today. It would have never happened. So I guess, again, my message would be to anyone listening to the podcast is like, you need perspective and it's okay and life takes you through ups and downs that then prepare you for what comes after that and i always see it like whenever i have a problem and i try to solve it i i look at it from different angles like from a doctor point of view from an interior designer point of view and i know it sounds like it doesn't sound very like very normal but but at the end of the day i still think it made me stronger so um, I'm, i i don't regret any of it I think it sounds normal, uh, actually, especially in sports or football, because when you take advantage of all of your background experience, um, and if we look into it, football and sports, we need that. Uh, football is a business, or sports in general, is a business that aggregates everything. Fashion, analytics, medicine, uh, even food and beverage. I work in food and beverage, and it's a, um, a huge help for uh, some things in football to apply in the business. So everything that you did, uh, your pathway, entire pathway makes sense today. You have all the resources that you need. Maybe you, you don't need to, let's be ironic here or, or with a bit of humor, you don't need to Google it. You already know it by your own experience. This is a fact. Yeah. Um, advancing in this interview, you mentioned um, your mother, uh, Shalimar Reynal, um, before in this interview. And you joined her in, in a one rare entrepreneurship back then and even today. Uh, one of the first representation agencies led by women. How was it uh, back then? Did you see a professional path in football possible? And if you can aggregate to that, how important was the role of your mother in building the career that you have reached today? I love this question. Um, I owe so much to my mother. You have no idea. I hope that one day I'll repay, I'll repay her, even if it's a fraction of it. But um, look, as I was telling you earlier, when I first started working with her, I knew that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. But I also knew that I would have to pave my own way into it. 
Like I remember looking at posting jobs on LinkedIn for, for football positions, like in TV networks and in teams and in, uh, you know, federations, even confederations. And I remember looking at what they were asking in, you know, for experience based stuff. And I didn't have any of that. I actually had a degree in fashion. Like I just didn't have any of what they needed. So I knew that from the get-go, if I wanted to build a career in football that would last a lifetime, I would have to start creating those jobs for myself. And that's how I really became uh, an entrepreneur, right? Like I did it, I started with my mother who fortunately to me was paving the way for me because she was ahead of me and she had been doing it for a, for a long time and she's a fierce negotiator and she's just a perfect agent in, in terms of like having the skill set to do it. Um, but once, you know, once I spent a few years next to her and I started seeing, Hey, like this doesn't exist. And I want it to exist, which was more like the, the online aspect of football, right? Like I, I was experiencing football offline and I think we all do in a way that is amazing, right? Like when you're in a stadium with your friends, watching your favorite team or where you're at home watching a, a, a match uh, that is very important, or even if you're on a pitch playing with people, it's such an incredible experience offline, right? But the second you go back home and you're alone, experiencing football online is not a great thing. Uh, and I always had that idea in my mind. I'm like, I don't, like, I, why doesn't it exist? Like, why are we having such a hard time to connect on a thing that is so global? Like half the world likes the sport. Why is there not people out there designing digital products to, to make this a better experience? And, and again, like I was having these ideas and I'm like, okay, well, is there a company doing it? No. Uh, okay, well, there's companies doing it in other sports. Maybe I should join them. And then at some point I had to come to the same conclusion. I'm going to have to build my own path. And if I want to be the CEO of a um, football tech startup, then I'm going to have to build a startup. And it became like something that I think I've shared with a lot of women, which is at the end of the day, if you want to work in an industry and you don't find an in, like you don't find a way to go in, uh, just created yourself. I mean, you guys did it with this podcast, right? Exactly. And thank you so much <laughs> for recognizing this. <laughs> we feel very proud, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you should. You should. You should. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the way to go. And I think that today it's much more normalized. Maybe a few years ago it wasn't. But like, if you want something, you need to go out and build it. And then, you know, there's a lot of consequences that come with that. Unfortunately, it's not easy. A lot of people are going to tell you that you can't do it. It's going to become hard in, in the psychological aspect of it because it's a roller coaster. Like things go great and then things go wrong. And it's not a job that you leave at home. You know, it's not a nine to five that like at five you're done and you don't care about what happens to the company. Like this is an ongoing thing that you dream about even when you're sleeping. So it is not easy, but I think it's definitely possible. And it's something that at least for myself, uh, gives me so much purpose. I mean, I jump out of bed, like this is the best thing I could be doing. Victor, fast forward to today, let's talk about Silicon Soccer, a company where you as, uh, act as a CEO and the co-founder. So you did become the CEO, as you were mentioning. So could you please tell us about this project and the value proposal of your company? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I laugh when, when anyone tells me like, ah, she's the CEO of, like, I don't think I'm the CEO of nothing today. One day, probably the company is going to be big enough and I'm going to feel like I'm the CEO of something. But, um, but yeah, so, so Silicon Soccer is really the legal name, um, but it's the, the name of the company is Gloria Football. And, and Gloria is, is all my dreams come true. Uh, it's, it's a company that is focusing on building the home of football online. We are really trying to build a product today that will get everyone that loves the sport in one place. And when I say everyone that loves the sport, I mean players, I mean fans, I mean men and women, I mean young people, I mean older people. And I mean people from every single corner of this planet. And, you know, understanding and knowing that this is a sport that has the scale it has, then connecting all of them into one place was 
something that felt impossible at the beginning, but today, a year and a half in, I think is more possible than ever. So, so that's really what Gloria does today. The value proposition is to have people come and connect with each other around the sport. And within the sport, there's many different things that you can connect around. You can connect around your favorite player. You can connect around your favorite team. You can connect around the academy or the Sunday league that you participate in. You can connect as a professional that works in the industry. You can connect as an agent or a scouter. So there's so many different interactions and we want to become the home for all of them. So to do that, I partnered with Matias, who is my co-founder, who is the brains behind all of this. He worked at Facebook for many years before, has a ton of product experience, has built community at Facebook and in other companies and, and had the exact skill set that I was lacking, right? Which is, okay, this is the vision. I want to build this, but now how do we do it? How do we build it in a way that it's compelling for the consumer? How do we compete with big journalist platforms like Instagram and TikTok and Twitter? And how do we make it a much better experience? So for that, every time that you think about football, when you're not on a pitch or in the stadium, but you're alone at home, you launch Gloria on your phone. Yeah. And uh, as you said, uh, your dream came true and uh, you launched Gloria, Gloria Hub. That is probably the most important baby of your company. Can you develop to our audiences, what is this app all about, as you did uh, in, some, in some parts before, but what specific needs for the football industry are you solving with it? So as I was telling you before, we kind of looked at the football landscape and there are some very clear issues happening that we think Gloria can solve for. Um, the first one was this fragmentation and scattering of online football communities. So today, if you're a fan or a player and you want to consume football content, whether it's a video or an article or whatever it is, uh, you have to go to so many different places that the experience is really poor, right? So the first problem that we're solving is that, okay, we're going to get everything in one place for you. So you don't have to worry about where, where to go consume and, and experience the sport that you love the most. The second issue is more around players and it's more around scouting. Uh, this is something that I obviously have a lot of experience in and that I feel very comfortable talking about because I've suffered the problem myself as an agent many times around, which is, you know, today getting scouted for a club is a very painful process and it's a very manual process where a lot of people are involved and it's not about your talent at the end of the day. It's about how lucky you are if things align in your way. And to me, that feels very unfair. So we think that through Gloria, we can solve for it by creating a place where the next generation of mega stars are going to hang out on because they want to, right? It's not like they have to. It's not like a LinkedIn of football where they have to go and create their profile because that's what... They're hanging out on Gloria because they already love it, because they're getting you know, all the connection they need and all the information they need uh, to experience the sport. And, and then through that and leveraging their time on the platform, how can we connect them directly to the people giving them the opportunities, whether it's a professional club or it's a scholarship here in the US, um, all of those paths are gonna kind of, kind of come after. But again, like if we don't get the first piece, the first community piece right, scouting won't matter. So it is something that is in the DNA of the company and that we care about a lot, but we still are more focused today and making sure it's an inclusive place for everyone where you can come and like really find your way of enjoying the sport, whatever that way is, right? And then the third thing that we are working on solving, um, and I, I don't think it's a problem per se, but it's definitely something that we make you know, we spend a lot of time on, which is women's football, right? And, and we were talking about it before the call. It's become a big thing in the last couple of years with an explosive growth and, and really kind of getting people to understand that this is something, that this is the future of the sport, that people are going to start watching more and more women play. And it's going to be as entertaining as men. And I think that if you look at the women's football landscape today, 
in terms of products and in terms of you know what's out there from a consumer standpoint is incredibly segregating so it's like only for women right women's football platforms and women's football instagram pages and women's football facebook groups and all of that and i honestly think and this is not what I think. This is what a lot of female footballers have told me. They don't want to be treated differently. They don't want to be treated like there are some kind of other species within football. They want to be treated as a footballer. And I think that the best way to solve for that is creating a space that is welcoming for both. And that is not talking about gender as much as other platforms may be doing it right now, right? Um, for that, like I'm, I also am a UN ambassador for gender equality in football. Uh, it's something that I have been working on for a long time. I truly believe in it. Um, and it's something that we will see Gloria grow into in a way that I think very few companies have. I'm very excited about the plans that we have. And, and I think that if you're interested in this space, you should definitely be looking out for, for what we launch next. Now that you mentioned that you have these huge plans, we are aware that these high tech projects, they demand a lot of resources. Can you please tell us from your experience, from the things that you have lived, how is it dealing with this tech investor sharks as a woman, as an Argentinian, as a women CEO from a technology company? Could you please tell us from this perspective? <laughs> I, the first thing I would say is that I don't have any tech shark investors. Now, my, my investors are very nice. There are no, no sharks. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look, I think that there's def different paths of building a business. You can bootstrap the business from the get-go uh, or you can raise capital, which was something that I didn't know was available to me until you know a couple of years back. It is a very competitive space. Raising capital is not easy. There's a ton of very good startups trying to do the same and trying to get the same money. Uh, for whatever they're doing. So for us at the beginning, you know, raising capital was definitely the way to go because in the technology business, the, the, it's easier if you, you can have the working capital to essentially iterate the product as many times as you need it until it becomes something that consumers really want. But I must say that when we first started, uh, football was not a thing here in the US, especially not for venture capital. Uh, they, they really, I mean, we would, we would pitch them and they would look at me and they wouldn't understand what was going on. It was like a Latin woman with a very strong accent talking to them about a sport they have no idea about, trying to build something that seemed and like just was too ambition to even, to even talk about, right? Like getting 3 billion people in one place. Um, and as we pitched and we pitched, you know, like several hundreds of investors at this point, we started educating them and starting to show them that, you know, football is a sport that they should be investing in because it's, you know, arguably speaking, the largest audience in the world. Like it's bigger than religion, it's bigger than music. And I don't see why, if they're going to be investing in self-driving cars, why they wouldn't want to be investing in a business that's going to touch, you know, exponentially more people. So the beginning, it was, you know, it was all about breaking that stigma and the stereotype around, you know, football is a sport that matters in the rest of the world, even if here in the U.S. sometimes it feels like it doesn't. And then after that, it was, it was really finding, you know, a co-founder for me uh, that, that could, could help me in terms of, of the skill set and complementary skill set. And after that, you know, we found and we're very lucky. We, we got invested by a very, very big investor um, from, from the very beginning, which was Alexis Ohanian, who's the co-founder of Reddit, uh, who's also a very well-known investor that has done incredibly good bets on companies that today have become unicorns. And that is also for the sports world married to Serena Williams. So has all of that, um, that sports cred, I guess. Uh, but anyways, Alexis, you know, was seeing that there was something going on in football and people were not paying attention, attention to it here in the U.S. And when he met us, I think it was pretty straightforward. Like he knew this was an opportunity and he trusted that we would be the team to bring the, to bring the solution to the market and has been an incredible supporter since day one. I mean, it's, he, he's been amazing. So, so yeah, that's my investors are not sharks, but they're amazing. Uh, and 
I guess the last thing I would say on this is that a lot of women maybe don't think that this is available to them or think that it's harder uh, for them than it is for men. And actually it is, it is much harder. There's way less money available for women than there is for men. But I think that's changing today. And it's something that a lot of uh, funds are being very careful about. And so that creates an opportunity, right? They're looking at more women and they're, they're wanting to invest in them. But again, you know, on a personal level, it's a very, very hard process, at least for me, it has been. You, as you were saying, you know, Gloria is my baby. And when you go into a meeting and you put all of your cards on the table and you show all your passion and you explain them, you know, every single detail of everything that you've thought through in a way that's compelling and it's understanding and that really paints a picture of what you want to build. And then people say, well, no, we don't want to invest in you. And like getting those no's at the beginning for me, it was, it was, it was really painful. And, and I think that today I got used to it. It makes me stronger. And the mindset that I have around it is like, look, every time I stand in front of my investor and I tell them about my business, they will bring up something that I didn't think about my business. They will show me where my blind spots are, or they will give me ideas on, on, on about things that I should be thinking differently or from a different point of view. And to me, that is a privilege. So if you're out there and you're thinking about raising money or, and you're scared about it, just change your perspective. Just say, this is an exercise where I want to learn more about my business. So I become a stronger founder and I become a stronger CEO uh, and I become a stronger leader at the end of the day. And then, you know, if someone believes in me enough that they want to give me money, then that's a great plus. But, uh, but at least I move on with knowledge, which at the end of the day, to me, is much more important than anything else in, in life. No one can take knowledge away from you. They can take your money. They can take your reputation. They can take a lot of things, but not, not your knowledge. Exactly. And knowledge sharing is so important. We need to understand that uh, because it will only bring us one thing, is development for everybody. Exactly. Uh, Sharing knowledge is the, the, one of the most important things. And you said something uh, very important too, is that football is a sport that matters. And you said that uh, in, uh, in America, you don't, don't see that much, especially, uh, yeah, it's a great country. Uh, but exactly, this is especially uh, regarding women's football, is where we have seen more changes. Uh, because football is a platform for change. And in America, it's one of the, the countries where we, we have seen uh, players speaking out and um, making uh, their position. And this has been a repercussion also to, for example, to Europe, where the players are now, the women players are now uh, having some courage to change also their perspective and saying, okay, we are here, this is our place as a woman as a normal woman, and we can also make money, and we hope one day this, this will uh, be uh, more fair, more equal uh, in some years when the business is a, will be a great business, I hope, and the women can make, and I, I will not say the same as men, but <laughs> in 10 years... Oh, no, they will make the same as men. We, we, have, have, to, we have to think that way. We have to think that way. Yes, yes, no yes, yes. Equality, equality starts in your own brain. Exactly. That's where it starts. Exactly. If you don't think equally, you will be treated differently. That that is gonna that that is a fact. Exactly. So yeah, I I will leave to the day and I say this with a lot of you know a lot of confidence, but I will leave and if I have to work for it and I will absolutely get involved to see the day where a female footballer makes the same exact amount of money as a male footballer in the top leagues in the world i hope so i hope so and and i believe in it i have to say that i when i i'm talking about this especially with maria um, i always say it with a european perspective because of course in america uh, there should be no discussion about it right now it should be done it the women in, in america right now uh, should should have here too but of course with it's my perspective, and I have to say it here, uh, not only talking about as a woman, but when your business doesn't give you the, the same uh, revenue 
uh, of course, you will not have uh, the same amount of money. But at the same time, you need to receive what you deserve. And this is what we are fighting for in um, here. I'm, I'm talking for a, an European perspective because we need to uh, uh, upstage this. And, and, and let me take two minutes uh, here because, for example, one of our guests, Helen Ward, she is not considered yet as an elite player because of this lockdown in, in England. She is basically the um, top goal scorer uh, of Wales. And in two weeks, she passed from a position of being a, a, an elite player to uh, an amateur player. And this is something that is not happening in men's football. And we need, it's not only about money, it's about money, it's about the positions that we have, it's about everything that evolves it. So we need to portray these cases and to stand up for them, uh, basically. But let, let's move forward. <laughs> Sorry for this, but let's move forward for the next question. Um, from your experience with Gloria as a massive data uh, gathering software, would you agree that data could become an enhancer for women's football growth? Should digitalization take part in grassroots development, for instance, to build a speech around how it is not a matter of gender rather than a discussion on talent? Yes, I, I actually think that you know, technology will change football in a way that very few people can understand it today just because for the last 50 years people have been operating in the same exact way when it, when we relate to scouting when we relate to to building teams to building clubs and i think that technology will give us a lot of the data that that we need to make better decisions whether they're, you know, around choosing uh, to scout in different locations versus choosing to scout different types of plays. I mean, we can speak about this topic in particular for hours and hours and hours. In the case of Gloria, we're not a data gathering software in the sense that we're like the data that we gather is mostly to make the product better. It's not for anything else. But I do think that in the future, we may see some interesting, some interesting insight around women. And, and, and that's because women are more diligent too. That is, that's again a fact in terms of, you know, uh, uploading content and like really understanding how to become better in different things. And, and also because they, they get to start from a different place, right? It's like when you're a man and you're wanting to play football, everything is at your disposition. And when you're a woman, depending on where you are, especially in places like South America, it is not straightforward at all. So like you again, kind of build that resilience around, okay, if I want this, I'm going to have to work 10 times harder at it. And, and that I think is generating a lot of data and different platforms, not, not on Gloria, that we will then be able to kind of gather and start analyzing. And this is a few years down the line, I think, but it's definitely going to tell us how women can become better trained because I think that today that's a big problem, right? Uh, when you watch a women's game and you watch teams like Argentina, and I'm going to speak very specifically about cases that I know very well because I think that that's the fairest thing to do. But, you know, in Argentina, you have some incredible players. Uh, Banini, number 10, who now no, no longer plays with the team because they treated them so badly, has been called the, the, the female Messi many many times mm -hmm. and when you see this team play together uh, you will see that they are lacking in training and uh, not in talent but yes in training and that is something that should not happen that it's just should not happen uh, if men are being trained properly women should be the same and then on top of that you have the layer of like the revenue or, or the, the, the money generating aspect of it which is most of the girls that were playing in the, in the national team that went to the World Cup in France had two or three extra jobs to be able to play in the World Cup. And actually, some of those girls were even fired from their jobs that, you know, they were cooks at schools and cleaning ladies. And I mean, just had all these jobs and they were fired from them because they would had to take, you know, three weeks off to go to the World Cup. And, you know, when you combine all those things together and you say, okay, 
there's obviously a ton of things that need to change for women to keep growing, but one of them will be training and data is going to help a lot there. So, so I hope to see, you know, and I, I don't hope, I know it will happen. Uh, we will learn a lot more about the women's game. It's already been proven. Germany pro proved the, uh, I don't remember exactly who they were. I'll tell you the name after, but they proved that, and men have and women have the same ability as men to um to play tactically and i think that that was a big finding and as we continue to to look into it and to analyze it we'll find that you know women can be as good as men when they're playing with a the ball uh they the, the my my favorite fact of all times is that when women get hit they spend and they fall on the ground, they spend five times less time than men, meaning that they're much faster in just getting up and getting on with the game instead of dramatizing whatever happened. Exactly. And I think I can speak for Maria, we agree in everything. We are reaching the end, Victoire. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation and sharing your amazing project ideas and uh, your pathway with us. We really hope that you can be the leader of a new way of discovering talents, gathering the football world and consequently uh, changing lives. And to our audience, you know you can listen to all our episodes on the podcast platforms and also on YouTube. On social media, follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the name Two Goals Podcast. Thank you and take care.